All right, good morning. All right, well, today I'm going to talk to you about something. Hopefully, you're going to apply it to my, your life tomorrow, right? So, you guys in a good mood? All right, good. We'll change that today for you. All right. So, hey, we're in a series on um, Family Matters in 2020, just to kind of let you know, middle last year, uh, third quarter of last year, kind of started putting down questions that people were asking, things that people were struggling with, and then put together a package, a, a series serm, a series um, on some of the issues that we're struggling with. And so we're in week three, I believe it is. Does that sound about right? Yes. We're in week three. And today we're going to talk about one that I think is a big issue. Uh, we're not going to make it all through the message today, so we're going to do part one and part two, all right? I had too much and I started cutting down and I was like, nah, I need to, need to say these things. And so uh, we're going to do part one, tar- part two. So if you're a fill in the blanker, is there anybody, anybody a blanker around here, right? It's okay. We're going to get through it. We're just going to do part two next week, all right? So take a deep breath. It's all right, all right? Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to be okay. All right. Otherwise, you're going to track me down on the, on the way out. It's like, right here. What is that one right there? And I don't remember what it is. So, all right. So um, we're going to talk about today raising kids in a digital world, all right? And I think that uh, it is one of the questions that I oftentimes get uh, from, from families, both parents and grandparents. You know, they're concerned about a lot of the different issues and struggles um, that they have going on with that whole concept. And, and so I want to kind of share with you a little bit about my experience, what I've kind of felt, uh, prayed about, sorted through, and how to navigate. And then we're going to end with uh, some biblical advice on, on some areas that we need to, to take a look at it. So let me share with you on the, uh, on the screen here. These are a couple uh, s- shots that we've had for the last uh, um, couple weeks. So parents believe raising kids today is more complicated when the, than when they were kids. And so 44% strongly agree and uh, 34% somewhat agree, which is like a six and a half to a seven. And so I would say that that's probably pretty true. The conversations I had with the people, both parents, Parents and grandparents, it's like, you know, uh, yeah, it definitely seems like it's more complicated today uh, in our world of raising kids than it was when I was, was a child. So I want to show you the next slide. The next slide is, why do you think parenting today is more difficult, right? So why do you think parenting is more difficult? So look at on here, 65% say technology and social media is the hardest part of parenting a child. Right? And again, I think that that's probably pretty true. I actually think that that's, that may be a little low, actually, to be honest with you. And I think that the vast majority of people feel like, man, it is so difficult to, to try to navigate through. 52% say the world is a more dangerous place. This is free of charge. This is my opinion. I think that the world isn't any more dangerous than it was when I was a kid or my parents were kids. I think with the instant access of, of social media and computer and stuff like that, we hear stuff so quickly. Uh, something happens in Virginia before 911 shows up. It's already on someone's social media, and we're already running with it. So I don't know that it's necessarily worse than it was uh, when when we were growing up or when my parents are growing up. Forty percent of parents say a lack of common morality is uh, is a reason why it's difficult. And so then it and then it begins to go in financial factors and all that other kind of stuff. Now to me, the 65 percent is probably true. I think it's a little bit low, but I, th- I still think that it's, it's an issue. And I think part of one and part of three are connected. The lack of common morality, I think a lot of parents are struggling with how to navigate through that because our kids are being exposed uh, to some, su- some stuff that we're not really sure about. And we feel a sense of being just overwhelmed when it comes to the technology age. And would, would most of us agree with that? That's probably pretty true, yes, yes. And so here's the conversations that I've had, even with people in the tech field, people who are involved in the technical uh, side of working with computers and programming and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to go old school on some of you, right? How many of you remember CD backslash semicolon? Raise your hand. Glory to God. We got some old folks in here. All right. (laughs) Right? Some of you are Apple or uh, uh, Apple. Microsoft and, you know, uh, all that stuff, you're like, what in the world is that? Well, that was before all those things, right? So we had to go back to uh, those days, right? Floppy drives, remember that? Yeah? All right. So just checking. Remember buying that 808, uh, 8, it was an 8, 
80, 88 computer was that first time we bought one. The guy said he gave us a little floppy and I forgot what it had. I mean, it had this little minute bit of RAM and he goes, you will never use more than that ever in your life, right? You remember those days, right? Now our phones, right, our, our watches have more memory than, than those things. So anyhow, here's how we feel. Number one in your outline. <clears throat> and this is what I think that many of us feel and will relate to this. The pace of technology has surpassed our capacity to develop enough wisdom to handle it, right? Even techie people feel like things are happening in social media, in games and so forth. It's hard to keep up with all this stuff. How do, how do we move past and how do we get into that? And so there's a sense of just feeling absolutely overwhelmed, Right? We feel overwhelmed. And so how do we handle the new apps our kids are going to install in their phones next week? Right? The truth is, we don't even know how to handle the current technology our family is using in their phones and tablets today. And so how do we handle the new thing that's coming around the corner that your kid is going to be exposed to when the truth is, we don't even know how to really navigate our own stuff in our, in, our, in our own systems, in our own screen time, phone, tablet, and computer, and so forth. And so as a parent, we just feel a sense of overwhelmed, and, and we're not sure. And, and so what, what ends up happening is, is we, we kind of go through these stages where we're like, we don't know, do we just like give up? Do, do we become engaged in it? How do we become engaged uh, in, the, in the process of all this stuff? And so here, here's what I wanna do. After prayer and fasting, seeking the face of God, right? I, I finally, I'm gonna show you a picture. This is gonna be the message in a nutshell. As soon as it's over, we're gonna take the offering and we're all gonna go home because this is how powerful this picture is gonna be to, to help you understand the point of what I think you need to do. Are you all ready? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Let's see the picture. <laughs> there it is. We just go Amish. <laughs> Ushers, go ahead. Make your way forward. Let's go. If you haven't noticed, that is a picture of me <laughs> being imposed into, you know, uh, uh, Abe the Amish man. <laughs> right? <clears throat> now, I, I kind of joke and I say that, but, but I am fascinated with the Amish people. I've sh shared with this. I've been back there to, to Lancaster several times. I've studied them. I under, kind of understand their mindset. It's interesting, their mindset. I don't necessarily agree with it, but, but it's interesting why they do what, they, what they're doing, and it's simply this. They don't want their families, in a simple kind of uh, way of explaining it, they don't want their families exposed to the things of the world because they believe that they're to be different than the world. And so their thing is, is that they're going to get off the, quote, grid, right? They got off the grid before it was, like, cool to get off the grid, <laughs> right? Now we want to get off the grid, but for different reasons because things of whatever. All right, moving on. And, and so, and so they, they want to separate. And so here's the struggle I think that many of us have is it's like, how do you balance that? So do we go no technology in our home at all and we just kind of divorce ourselves of all that or do we embrace it and then how do we balance it out? And then the conversation leads this way and this is what most of the parents that I've talked to and they, they start asking me the questions. Well, how much time should my kid be exposed to it, right? And, 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 and I'll be very honest with you. I literally changed the message because I did kind of seek out God, not kind of. I did spend some time with God and I changed my second point. Because initially I had a bunch of stuff of what some uh, pediatricians and psychologists and so forth said that we needed to allow our kids to be exposed to it. And I changed it because I really felt that God was impressing on me that, it, that, we're, that, that that's the wrong way to start. Be because, here's why. Because if something is bad, how much time do you want your kid or grandkid to be exposed to it? None. None. Right? And so what ends up happening with parents is the pediatrician says two hours, the psychiatrist or psychologist says two hours. I read in a book that says, you know, an hour and a half. Whatever that number is, pick a number. But if it's wrong stuff, it's still wrong. Right? And if it's good stuff, don't you want to expand it? 
right? And so we get locked into this idea of a certain amount of time. And so what I came up with is I came up with seven questions. And I'm sure that there could be a whole lot more, but there are seven questions I think that we need to, to really look at. And so get rid of my picture. Number two in your outline, <laughs> questions parents should ask about technology. Sorry to, uh, to put you through all that. <laughs> so here are the seven questions that I think that are, that are helpful to ask. Letter A in your outline. Has this technology brought your family closer together or pushed you apart? Right? And, and moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, wannabe parents down the road, whatever it is, you've got to ask yourself that question. Is it, is, it, is it drawing you together? Right? Because not all technology is bad. My son, Brandon, who is here, he has this thing that he brings over to our, our, our house when we have a, a, an events, and there's questions. He ties into the TV. We do it through, our, through our, our phone. It is absolutely hilarious. It's like a board game with technology. And it's fun. We're laughing. We're having a great time. So not all technology technology drives us apart, but there are some technologies that do drive us apart. And I talked last week about a house not having a mantle. If you missed last week, you can grab a CD or listen online. But that is something that's missing in, in our home. We don't have a, quote, focal point, and so everyone kind of goes to the four corners of their house, and as a result, they're not spending time together. So we ask, is the gadget, the thing that your kid, grandkid is going through, is it drawing you together or pushing you apart? It's a yes or no, right? Letter B. How does this game, phone, computer, tablet benefit your family? Just ask yourself that question. Is it making us you know, a better family, stronger family? Letter C in your outline. And this is a big one. Can your, chi uh, can your children disengage easily from this device? And parents, what's the answer? No. It's not, right? And they go kicking and screaming. And we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about that in, in a moment, all right? Has letter D, has this device changed your child's behavior, personality, or mood in any way? You got to answer that question. Right? And there is a lot of, now we're just finally seeing a lot of new data coming in from how brains of a child develop with technology and how it's different. And I'll be very candid with you, you can read some of it, it scares me to death because the brain isn't quite developing the same way that it used to in the past. And so there's a lot of things in there you need to pay attention. You can do your own research on that, uh, on, that on those areas, all right? Uh, letter E in your outline, has your child lost interest in any other activities or relationships since it was introduced to whatever this game or whatever it is that they're, they're using? Some of the kids are upset with me today. Letter, letter F in your outline, <clears throat> um, does your child view use, uh, usage of this device as a privilege or a right? And this is another one that parents talk to me about. Letter C and letter F, I hear all the time. And parents, what is the answer to that? Yes, they think it's a privilege and a right. In fact, they don't know who the framers are in our Constitution. They don't even know what the Constitution is, but they believe they have a right to whatever it is that they're playing with in the games and stuff. So just kind of an interesting world in which we live in. <clears throat> Letter uh, G in your outline. How would your family change if you took away this device altogether? Right? And again, every, <laughs> all the kids just went, <gasps> <laughs> and some parents. And we'll talk about that next week, right? Because uh, I think it's 36% of children are concerned that their parents are addicted to electronics. 36%. So should we just say amen and now show the picture and all go home? Amen. Right? Yeah. So, so those are questions. Now let me share with you briefly and then we're going to get into to more of what I know, which is the Bible part. All right? Oftentimes you hear a message and the first thing you do is you're like, Pastor Dan is dead on. We're going home today, honey. And when we walk into that house, everything has got out of here. And we're going to sit down the kids and we're going to go, we're going back to Etch-A-Sketch. <laughs> and that's the way it is. All right? And all the kids are like, ah, we don't like Pastor Dan. Right? 
We think he's like a principal and he needs to just go in his office and be quiet. And we think he ought to move back to Lancaster. In fact, we're going to do a cookie drive so we can get him out of here, right? And, and so here's what I say. Don't do that, right? I think it's best, and hear me, because I don't have time to meet with you guys. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Mom and dad first decide together what the plan is. Let me say it one more time. I'm going to, what Brandon, you know, today. Mom and dad meet together and come up with the plan is. And if you missed it, mom and dad meet together and come up with the plan is. And then institute that in small steps, right? If they've gone from nine hours a day on the internet, don't go to zero tomorrow, right? Begin to wean them off of it, step them backward in the process, right? Otherwise, you're going to have a fist fight. There's going to be a riot at whatever address you live at, right? And the police are going to show up because the kids are going to absolutely have a meltdown. So better to kind of bring them on board than it is to, to cut them off. And better to have mom and dad on board because here's what's going to happen. Shall I demonstrate it for you? Right? Whoever the one is who's the disciplinary in the home, and there's always one, and they're going to go in and they're going to lay down the law. And the other one is the sympathetic person. And guess who that was in my house? Me. Absolutely. Right? And so all of a sudden, mom would, right, and, it, you know, and we kind of navigated through it, and mom would, right, and then pa Pastor Dan at some point realized that I needed to start backing up because, I, you know, when you undermine your spouse, that's not a good thing, right, because I'm the parents like, hey, you guys are jumping off the bed. Hey, let's jump off the bunk bed. Hey, let's take the mattress outside. We'll jump off the roof together, <laughs> right? And mom's like, someone's going to kill themselves. I'm like, who cares? Let's go anyway. Woo, Right? So you, get, you gotta be on the same page. Are y'all with me on that, right? And, and so I think it's important that, that you're all on the same page. So if you're interested, the book that I got a lot of stuff, I don't think it's the best read ever, but if you like to read, and it's very practical, challenging at times, and it's called The Wise Tech Family, and it's written by a Christian guy, and all the, all the graphs that I've been showing you, which are part of Barna, um, has, have, have them in there, and it's very enlightening. I think it's very encouraging and challenging uh, as well, all right? So y'all with me on that? Yeah. All right, so now let's talk about where, more the, where I really wanna focus at this week and next week. And, and that is that technology, uh, regardless of what the technology and how it changes, it doesn't change our role and responsibility as parents, what God has called us to do. So technology can be Etch-a-Sketch, it could be back in Moses' day with, with stone tablets, or it can be crazy technology that we current have, currently have today. God's calling in our life as parents and grandparents hasn't changed. And so what we need to do is we, we need to look at the end game. What is it that we want our kids and our grandkids to be and do? And then begin to step back to see, are we creating that path for them to become that young man or young lady in their life, right? And instead of getting all caught up in the technology and going Amish and saying everything's out because it's all bad, right? Or just saying we're going to embrace it all together, but it's to say, to say this, what do we want our kids and our grandkids and if you don't have kids yet and you're hoping to have kids, what do we want them to be and to do? What is God's calling or responsibility on our life. And so number three in your outline, God's goal for parenting. And this is something that has never changed. Regardless of how innovative our society may be or culture may be, it hasn't changed. And here it is. Are you ready, parents? Parents, in your outline, you have to prepare your kids to move out and to transfer their dependence away from, uh, away from you and onto God. Okay? That is, regardless of whether we're back to Etch-a-Sketch, stone tablets, whether we all have, you know, computerized, whatever it is it, that we're carrying around, it doesn't matter what it is, technology does not change what our goal is. That when our child is grown, when our, uh, uh, when our grandkids are grown, they are to be prepared, 
right, to move out. We're going to talk about this th a little bit uh, more next week than this week. And, and that is that they're responsible, right, that they're, they have good character, that they have good moral, uh, moral character in their life. And so we prepare them to move out. Now, I realize that we, we live in a very expensive area in our community. There are a lot of adult children who've moved back to their parents' house for, for financial issues and all that stuff. I'm not throwing, I'm not saying any of that. That is a culture, unfortunately, that we currently live in in the Bay Area. There's a few other places in the United States that are like that. But the goal is, is that we're gonna prepare them to be able to move out and then to transfer their dependence upon you. Because when children or when babies are born, how, how dependent are they uh, uh, on you? And that is 100%. Right? And that's why young families will say to me, I just wish that I could get 30 minutes of sleep. Right? Well, why? Because your child is 100% dependent upon you. Right? And so we want to change that over a period of time. We want to change that where they become dependent not upon you, but upon God as the new provider in their life, right? And so there, there's a two-part thing. There's a social part of it in the sense that they're gonna be moving out, and then there's a spiritual part of it where they're, the, where they're going from you taking every spoonful and feeding them to a place where they're trusting God that he is the provider for them in their life. You all with me on that so far? All right, now let me show you a, another graph and then we're gonna jump into it. <clears throat> and so in, in this graph, uh, go ahead and put it on there. So four areas emerge as the most challenging for parents. Again, this is Barna stuff. What are the most difficult things about family life and raising kids? 34%, what's the very first one? Can you see it up there, church? Say it out loud, what is it? Discipline, discipline right? And that doesn't mean discipline like, you know, whack, whack, go to the room kind of thing. Okay, that is a discipline that they have in their life, that they're disciplined children. Remember what I said last week? I said good habits and character, good character go together. You cannot have good character without good habits. So parents, if you're not teaching your kids discipline, then I'll just be very bold with you and say this, they're not gonna have good character. All right, so 34% of parents say discipline. 34% say time management. We have too many things going on in the world and we don't have enough time. We'll talk about that next week. All right, number three in your outline, helping my kids develop good moral character. Now, I actually believe that, two, that one and three are the same because discipline and good moral character are the same. From a scriptural standpoint, it's the same. So the reality is that's 68% of parents say that it's difficult to raise kids in this area of discipline slash moral character. And we're gonna drill into that this week and next week, all right? And then, and then the last one is 33% monitoring technology and social media use, 33%, and then it falls off financial responsibility and all that kind of stuff, right? And, and so th this week and next week, I wanna kinda look at the, the, the top four and kind of really begin to drill a little bit deeper into what it means for you today and your kids and your grandkids next week. Okay, how that impacts them, all right? So y'all ready? All right. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter five, God gives Moses the 10 commandments, all right? So God says, here are the 10 commandments. The children of Israel are getting ready to cross over the Jordan River into the promised land, all right? Now, a lot of people say that the Ten Commandments were given so that they would, the, the Israelites would have a relationship with God. That isn't true. God gave them the Ten Commandments because he had a relationship with them. And the Ten Commandments aren't how to reach God. The Ten Commandments are how we are to live our life. And that's what he was telling them at the time. So they're wandering in the wilderness. They're getting ready to cross over, right? They get the Ten Commandments. They're going to cross over the, the Jordan River. And Moses calls everyone together in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. And he gives them, and I've said this if you've been here at Baby Dedication Services, he gives them the most concise job description of parents, and it will answer, right, and it will help us to understand why that we train our kids up to move out and to change their, their, uh, their discipline or their trust in us and onto God, 
their dependence upon us to God, all right? And this comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, all right? So you all ready? Ten commandments? Hey, folks, this is how you live. You're going to go into a new land, a land of milk and honey, and, it's life, and, and life is going to be uh, just absolutely great. Now, pause. Most parents want nothing but the best for their kids and grandkids. Would you agree with that? Right? I mean, unless there are some whack jobs out there, and I, I get that. They're just kind of whatever. But the vast majority of us want our kids to have a good life. In some cases, we want them to have, and many of you have sacrificed, it's, it's, it's amazing. You want your kids to have a better life, a better education than you yourself had an opportunity. Right? Would, would we agree with that? Right? Well, this is exactly what God says to Moses. God says to Moses, listen, you're going to leave slavery, and you're going to go into a new community, and you're going to go into the place, and God says to him, I want you to have an amazing life. And I want your kids to have an amazing life. And I want your grandkids to have an amazing life. And so here's what he says. Chapter 6, verse 1. These, command, uh, these are the commands, the decrees, the laws that the Lord your, uh, your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are, what's the word? Right? The Jordan to possess. So here we go. We're on a field trip together. We're going to cross over. Verse 2. So that, what's the next word? Okay, pause. So if you're single, this message is for you, right? If you hope to be married someday, this message is for you. If you're married, this message is for you. If you're a grandparent, this message is for you. If you're fortunate to be a great great parent, a, a great grandparent, this message is for you. So in other words, who's this message for? everyone right so this message is for all of us he said so that you your children and their children after they uh, 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 and their children after them may fear the lord your god all right so here's the goal the goal is to begin to mentor the goal is to begin to live a life where we want to train future generations to love God with all of their heart, all right? We want them to fear. Now, the word fear isn't like cower, like someone's gonna squish you. That word fear is like looking into the stars and just go, God, you are so amazing, right? It's an awe of God, all right? So he says that we are to fear God, right? So he says, fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, okay? Why? Why do we want to encourage that in our kids, our grandkids, and our great-grandkids? And uh, and he tells us why in the next part of the verse. So that you may enjoy, what is it? Long life, right? In other words, that your life's, the qualities of your life, your relationships, your finances, your self-esteem, how you view the world, everything emanates out of your love for God, your spiritual life. I say, Jesus, if he's not the core of your life, then your life isn't going to make sense, right? And he says, so out of that is going to emanate out of it, and because of he is, you're, you're loving him with all of your heart, life is going to be good, right? Which is what we all desire for our kids and our grandkids and, and our neighbor kids and everyone else. We want them to have a great life. Verse 3, <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, and this is, this is his way of saying to Moses, tell your people to pay attention because the next part of the verse tells us that. He says, you know, so pay attention, Israel, right? And be careful to obey so that, you, uh, so that it may go well, and here we go again, but that, we, that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey. God wants them to live a blessed life. Right? God wants them to be, live a blessed life. Just as the Lord, the God of your forefathers, promised you. And then verse 4 is a prayer that the Jewish people would pray three times a day. It became ritualistic, but initially the idea was it was advertisement. It was a reminder of what they needed to do. And so verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with, what's the word, with? 
circle the word all because we're going come to that, come back to that. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And you know I read that verse when we do baby dedications um, each time, right? That we are to love God with all, with all of our hearts, right? With everything that we have, we are to love, love them. Okay, you ready? And I think it was fitting um, what I, I read in a commentary, and I thought, well, talk about great timing and God's, God's, God's timing. I read an article on this idea of all, right, that we are to love God with all of our hearts. Now, this is, remember, this is for you, single, right, married, divorced, whatever situation, grandparent, great-grandparent, it's for you, right? We're to love God with all of our hearts. That this guy was talking about the idea of all, and he said, actually, in his opinion, that he thinks that it's better that a child either have all or none of God. Caught me, like, hmm, right? And his illustration was this, the flu vaccine. And I thought, perfect timing, right? That's on the news. On Thursday, I got an email from my doctor. Have you got your flu shot? Moving on, so... So I, I, I read it, and, and, you know, a flu vaccine is they take a part of the virus and they inject it in you, and your body works, it builds up its immune system so that when you get exposed to the full virus, and I'm not a doctor and a scientist, but, I mean, this is a layman's term, that your body is able to resist it, right? And his point is, is that when we expose our children to a little of God, they don't experience the fullness of God. So here's what he said. He said, when we expose our kids to a little of God, they begin to understand that God is about do's and don'ts, not about the all of God's transforming power in our life. And so they're exposed to do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, and they're not exposed to someone whose life has been radically transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. And I thought for a moment, I thought, man, that is powerful. That is powerful. That oftentimes you meet people and it's like, hey, you ought to come to church. Oh, I believe in God. And it ends. Right? And my hunch is, is if we were to like navigate and talk and ask questions, perhaps we would find out that they were never exposed to loving God with all of your heart. And the radical transformation that can take place in your life when you completely surrender 100% to God. And how is that not contagious in the people around us when they see God transforming your life? I mean, how is it not like, wow, it's amazing the transformation that is taking place. And so if we sit here today and we think about moving in and moving into the promised land and yet we love God with just a little of our heart, is the radical transformation really taking place? And I would suggest to you that the answer is no because it can't. Because unless you surrender fully to him, the transformation isn't going to take place. And you're going to know religion, and you know I hate that word, you're going to know religion, the do's and don'ts, and don't do this, and we can't do that, and we're not supposed to do this, and all this other stuff, but never the transformation, the unconditional love, the, the, the change that God can do in our life. And, and God says to Moses, Moses, listen. I want your kids and your grandkids to go into this new land that I've given you, and I want their lives to be absolutely phenomenal, amazing. But here's the catch. They got to love God with all their heart, and they're never going to know how to do that unless you live it out in your life. Because our faith is caught, it is not taught. It is caught. In other words, we model it in our homes. And so if we say, 
Pastor, you know, to our kids, you know, God, Pastor Dan said God's number one. Yeah, God's number one. Your kids and your grandkids are asking them, themselves this question. Does your action show it? Do your action show it? Now we sit here today, right, and we think that most of us, in both services and people who are watching online. I mean, it's not like you wake up on Thursday and go, you know what? New policy. God gets 33.3% of my heart. That's it. Right? The rest is going to whatever else. That, that's not the case. But the truth is, for many of us, we sit here today and we're honest with ourselves, there are other things that are competing for our heart with God. So what is that? I mean, why, it, why is that that all of a sudden we see that part of our life, when it comes to this word all, when it comes to that, it, it's like, you know, I don't know. If I'm brutally honest, maybe I, maybe I can say, you know, that God doesn't have all my heart. Well, what's the cause of that? And it, the cause is life. All the other things that go on, right? You have kids. You want them to have nice things. So you go to work and you provide for them. And then you want them to experience all the different experiences in life. You want them to go to dance and music and baseball and soccer and football and hockey and drama and church and, you know, name it, right? Hello? And you fill up your calendar with all kinds of stuff. Not bad stuff, right? And then all of a sudden you look and you kind of go, all my heart, you got all these other things going on. Now we sit here today and we go, well, you know, Pastor Dan, that's just the 21st century that we live in. And I would say to you, is it? You don't think that as Moses stood on the other side of the Jordan River, now grab a hold of this, he's going into a land to possess, which means there's going to be a little bit of a problem there. It's not a turnkey thing. He's got a million people. Houses to build, infrastructure to, do, uh, to build, stores to create, a city government, a state government, a federal government, a, a courthouse. I mean, he has all these things that he needs to create. You, you think they're standing on the, on, on the side of the Jordan, they're going, turnkey, baby. No, not at all. I mean, they're going to cross the river, and you know what? Their life is going to be absolutely overwhelmed, just like our life was. But the direction from God to Moses was, listen, life is going to happen. But if you sit here today and you want the best for your kids and grandkids, then here's what you need to make sure that you do. That you love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Because you are going to model that in life. And that means that you're not just participating in Christianity. You know, I don't even like that word, right? Because we're Christ followers. But that you're engaged in a biblical view of what the body of Christ is all about. So we don't come and just watch. We come to participate. We come to serve. We come to give. We come to encourage. We come to be a part of the body of Christ. Right? And this is part of that word, all. Now the danger is, is that we give our kids a little shot of God. And they never understand the life transformation of the power of God in a person's life. And this is the part where technology, no technology, I don't care, right? This is a part where you have your part of training your kids to move out, but this is the second part, that they're changing their dependence away from you and onto God, and they're watching you, and that's how they're going to learn. Now, when I, my kids were growing up, many of you know, Pat, Pastor Brandon's my oldest son. I got three boys, and, and so... The things when I was a young dad, the things that drove me crazy, because some of them have my pers some of my personality traits, <laughs> right? And, and so you didn't notice that. And so um, what, what's funny is the things that drive me crazy about myself that they have 
were conflicts in, in our relationship when they were growing up, right? So, like, I have an opinion. A couple of my boys have opinions. <laughs> and it drove me crazy. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, the, the, but the bigger message is the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Whether we like it or not, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And in our faith, our faith is modeled, right? I mean, it's caught and modeled more than it's taught. Sitting down saying, okay, Jesus loves you. Let me, let me preach a message to you. That's wonderful. But they're watching, and that has far more impact in our kid's life and then the stories that we read, the Bible scripture that we share. And that's why this part of all and you fit into your life. Whether you're a parent, soon-to-be parent, wanna-be parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, God has given us this amazing responsibility to shape the future generations in our faith. And that is absolutely amazing. And Moses says, hey guys, when we cross over, you want your life to be great. Here it is. Love God with all your heart. And model it for our kids. Let's pray. Father, as we wrap up today of this part, Lord, I just want to just kind of pause for a moment and ask that your spirit would literally speak to us. I know that there's areas in each of our lives that we need to make sure that we're right with you. And Lord, if there's areas in each of our individual hearts that you desire to change, that you desire for us to surrender more fully and completely to you, God, I pray that your spirit would speak to us and that we would make those changes necessary that are that are necessary for your glory and for your honor. And Lord, we're just gonna trust that your spirit is gonna speak to us. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ and I wanna give you that opportunity. We do a little ABC. A is admit that we're sinners. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again. And C is to confess him as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to uh, I, uh, I wanna give you that opportunity. And as I say this prayer, just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I have missed the mark. We have all missed the mark. And I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And today, I confess him to be my Lord and Savior Thank you for loving me. Lord, thank you for saving me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me on the back of the communication card that Brandon mentioned is a box there. It says accepting Christ or following Christ. Check the box. And then on the way out, there's some green bags on this back wall. You can grab one of those bags. Inside it is some information to help you to grow in your faith, all right? And then as always, we encourage you to give with a cheerful heart. God loves a cheerful giver. If you want prayer after the service is over, right over here by this exit sign, there'll be some folks who will be happy to pray with you. Now, you ready for a good story? Yes, ready? I'm going to tell it whether you're ready or not. It's going to be worth it, all right? I was going to lead with it, but you'll understand why I didn't, because if I would have led with it, you guys would have walked down on me, all right? So here it is. So when my kids were younger, they were probably 9, 10 years old. Brandon and Justin were probably 9, 8, 9, 10 years old. Um, I went to an uh, an older couple in my church. She was in her late uh, 80s, and he was in his early 90s. He was an engineer by profession, an engineer by uh, by education. Very bright guy. His health was failing, and so grandma was a little little concerned about him, and so she wanted me to go over and just make sure that he was okay spiritually and all this other stuff. And so I went over. They were the sweetest couple you could ever they were absolutely wonderful people and so I sat down I had a conversation with him he understood where he was at spiritually and so she started asking me questions she that time the church was much smaller there's a handful of kids running around the church my kids were them they lived at the church and so um, she said well what are your kids like to do now this has to do with technology games and so forth right and so that time my kids liked Game Boy okay write it down Game Boy and PlayStation, okay, PlayStation. Well, I'm dyslexic, and my brain every once in a while does a little jujitsu on me. 
So I'm sitting at her coffee table, uh, her, her kitchen table, and she says, well, you know, honey, what, is your, what, is, what do your boys like to do? And I looked at her, and I said, my kids enjoy playing the Playboy station. <laughs> and her eyes went, and I caught it, and I'm like, no, Game Boy and PlayStation, and my mind went a little goofy. God bless you. See you on the way out. <laughs>